morning, everybody. And we have uh, Professor Soundar Rajan with us today. He's a very eminent scientist from DRDO, former DRDO uh, director in the Defense Avionics Research Establishment. That's a laboratory in Bangalore uh, that focuses heavily into electronic warfare, cybersecurity, avionics research, all that, uh, you know, uh, uh, high end stuff with respect to electronics and avionics. Uh, he's also uh, uh, had some very uh, eminent achievements uh, when he's been the brain behind some of the major upgrades that we did on uh, MiG-27 aircraft and on Su-30. Su-30 was a, a very fine project where much of the avionic ideas, concepts were jointly put together by, uh, by him and uh, some of his colleagues and the Air Force. And we made the Russians work on it and then bring in. So the Su-30 MKI even today is much better than what the Chinese put up as Su-30 MKK or the J-11. Uh, so it's been a tremendous contribution from his side. Uh, he is currently a visiting professor with NIAS, National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore, which is a Tata funded research think tank located in India Institute of Science in Bangalore. Uh, we are today talking about uh, the challenges of cyber threat to aerospace, defense, and infrastructure sectors. Over the last 20 years, you've had a tremendous amount of, you know, cyber threat into focus on many areas, particularly in the context of problems in Europe and in uh, Central Asia with Russia's invasion of Georgia, Russia's problems with Ukraine, with Latvia, and of course, a whole lot of, you know, you, we, we discussed about the Stuxnet in Iran nuclear attack. And of course, India has been, the, you know, when I uh, was uh, heading the cyber, uh, uh, you know, uh, security issue uh, in air headquarters, we, we got a study done by a Canadian agency, which did a global study on cyber threat. And India was one of the topmost targets for cyber security, you know, cyber threats, cyber attacks. And most of those cyber attacks originated from China. Uh, so, uh, the challenges of cyber threat in the aerospace defense sector, particularly in the context, because that's the high end of the technology domain, and, and infrastructure like banking, railways, airlines, is very, very significant. If any of these get derailed, your whole you know, system in the country will come down to a grinding halt. So, I think uh, for this subject, we can't get anybody better than, uh, you know, uh, Professor Soundar Rajan to talk about all this. It's going to be a little technical, but I, I uh, ask all of you to pay good attention and then raise questions where you want to raise when the discussion starts. Uh, PMS, all yours. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to be talking to the Peninsula Foundation. <clears throat> the topic of today, uh, challenges of cyber threat to aerospace defense and the infrastructure sectors uh, is very interesting because basically because cyber threat affects everything. Cyber can uh, uh, affects, affect every minute of your life because uh, you are dependent upon cyber. So without uh, much delay, let's go further. So uh, since we are talking more about defense, we'll start with uh, all warfare is based on deception. See, this is um, uh, uh, it's a very absolutely true thing that uh, imagine what's happening today uh, uh, in our northern borders. Uh, it's extremely true. So uh, it is not that uh, only um, some people do it, everybody does it. Like yesterday we had uh, the Surya Grahan and uh, I was I couldn't but uh, think about uh, what uh, Krishna did uh, to win the war. Uh, he created a shadow uh, to 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 fool the enemy that the sun has set and uh, destroyed the enemy. Okay, so this is the most noble thing to do, the most uh, obvious thing to do. Uh, of course, like Mahabharata, we don't uh, meet at one place and fight. Those days they fought with uh, boundaries, but still they used deception. Now, cyber warfare, warfare, why is it becoming more important? Is that 
many people, uh, including mainly the US, uh, thought that, or were, since uh, till uh, say June 12, their official policy was uh, basically to use uh, cyber for defensive purposes. But then uh, in uh, 2015, uh, to very clearly brought out to that it will provide offensive cyber operations to augment other military systems, which means now the leading country in the world has declared um, that officially that it will use uh, offensive cyber operations. Now, maybe all the other countries were doing that, but now they all will have a sort of some kind of legitimacy in doing that. So definitely we can expect a problem uh, that offensive cyber will be used. And how will it be used? And uh, how we can avoid, how we can use it? Something that we will go through now. Now, uh, we used to call uh, computers, computer communications, computer everything. But now the modern, uh, if you go to college now for uh, learning computer systems, they talk about cyber physical systems. Basically because the computer, computer has become a ubiquitous, uh, it is part of our life. And uh, communication technologies are so advanced, we use the compute, computation, communication and control function together in all our activities. So all our activities are so entwined with the computer and hence uh, it is going to be part of us and affect everything that we do. So cyber physical system is as replace so-called computers, communications, etc. cetera. Uh, so in fact, uh, they orient, the teaching itself has oriented themselves towards looking at these integrated aspects of uh, cyber physical systems. Now, let's come to embedded systems. See, we all use uh, a PC, uh, so we know what a computer is. But uh, embedded system is what? Is it a mission computer in an aircraft? Yes, it is, of course. But then the embedded system is are embedded in everything that we see today. You take your car, you take a modern car, uh, especially the newer ones, uh, have at least uh, 40 computers in them, which are much more powerful than the original, uh, the IBMs that were. Okay, so we have the the robots, uh, robotic uh, industry. Look at that car manufacturing industry. Everywhere it is there, and of course the aircraft. The, before all this cyber and many things came, we were the aircraft was one of the most advanced uh, systems that were uh, embedded with systems long long time back. And, uh, and we did it very reliably, uh, very positively, and uh, hence uh, it was very reliable and people trusted the aircraft. Even now we trust by taking a big risk of traveling on, uh, by air um, when it is being controlled by a computer. Okay, um, more of that maybe later. But the most important thing is that computers get interconnected command and control network, real-time integration of vehicles. So this integrated systems where you have comp in computers talking to each other, controlling the entire system uh, is what is uh, more, it, 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 it affects the, uh, the guys who are, uh, who want to control something. See, basically the control function to control a system is for the good of the system. But once the controls, if they are centralized control or even distributed control, the other guys also can control the system. This is the main thing. So if you look at the other systems, one of the big example is a power grid, medical system, transportation, banking, so many of them. We will touch upon some of this now. So what is of course, uh, since uh, you have been part of the peninsula, basically we are talking about cyber attack and defense. So the attack sequence is to discover first 
gather information on system hardware, software, users, and operations to identify how best to attack the system. See, the cyber attack is not that easy as compared to pulling out a rifle and shooting somebody or pressing a button to release a, um, um, a missile, intercontinental ballistic missile to attack a city there. Uh, you have to do quite a lot of work. Of course, for uh, doing the missile also, you would have done years and years of decades of work to attack, arrive at that technology. But this is slightly different because the situation always changes. Then implement the attack to gain initial access or expand existing access. Then exploit the system, use, and then you, you now control the system. Uh, control the enemy system or whichever target you want. So in order to defend, uh, you should uh, uh, you, you should have try to get control and uh, to see whether anybody has unauthorized access to you. Uh, detect, it's very difficult. Then see if you can respond or recover. This is an ongoing game uh, like what we see, spy versus spy, and uh, it is a never ending game. Now, cyber attacks on infrastructure. I mean, this also goes to define what is infrastructure. Actually, it is extremely difficult to define infrastructure and extremely difficult, uh, difficult to uh, even define key infrastructure. Like here, it looks very good. See, the most of the attacks have been on energy systems, critical manufacturing, communications, etc. But there are so many other infrastructure systems which are interconnected financial services, food and agriculture, so and so, nuclear reactors, transportation systems, water, chemical, everything, information technology. Now, uh, this interconnectivity connection also uh, is a big issue because you can attack uh, the energy sector by attacking the telecommunication sector. So, uh, the, the, and if the government or if the agencies are going to identify a critical infrastructure, that itself is a big job. Uh, and it has to be a dynamic job. And uh, we'll have to, we can't simply take a policy decision, yes, this is our sector to be protected. The rest can be given lower priority. Of course, even if you identify them as sectors to be protected and given them appropriate, appropriate um, priorities, that's how systems work. Because when the resources are limited, you prioritize and you allocate uh, uh, priorities to each of the sector. Now let's look at uh, uh, infrastructure uh, like a power grid. Now the power grid from the power uh, plant side, uh, we have earlier we had a power plant connected to uh, through transmission lines and distribution system to the customers. Now uh, things are much more improved. We have a power plant you could have uh, renewable power sources, uh, then um, energy storage equipment. Now the problem of, of uh, the power grid, power generation, the electricity is, electricity has to be consumed as it is produced. It cannot be stored that easily. We can store, then it's an additional cost, additional infrastructure. So it is very ideal uh, for a uh, 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 generating plant to be connected to the plant that uses it, which is residential, commercial, industrial, etc. Now, it was open all these days. There were only power lines were running. Of course, there was some data running between these two. We have also, even in India, quite some time back, we have been using power line communication systems. But now, it is much more. The reason being, if you know the power consumption well, then you can produce accordingly. You can reduce losses. You can reduce production cost. So what has happened is more and more intelligence has been put. Every one of these are shared. For example, if you have a smart meter at home, uh, of course, it's very easy because you can see the bill on your mobile automatically, all those things. But your, your usage pattern, for example, when do you use the, 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 the cooker? When do you use the AC? When do you use, I mean, 
everything is getting recorded. There's a complete time history of the appliances being used. And hence, this is very useful to the, the guy who gives you the electricity board that supplies to you because it can automatically, uh, the, 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 you, your consumption record uh, data is automatically in suitable manner modified and sent to the power generation plants. And you can, you can depending upon whether in daytime uh, solar panels will help you or is it, uh, uh, is it windy, you can have uh, the pin power. So it's a most efficient way of doing things. So you can't avoid this. See, the point is, the, uh, they, they, they say if uh, all cyber attacks are happening because of interconnection, you're on the net, you're connected to another system, you stop connection. Then, uh, you know, it is like saying that uh, the safest uh, place for a ship is to be in the port. Uh, then what do you need the ship for? So in order to optimize and use, you have to have the advanced technologies like uh, the internet connecting all these things, uh, but then you pay a price. So it was originally very simply connected and the control was done only by uh, these guys. But then they realized there are many friends uh, who would like to help you out by taking control of the situation. And uh, why I'm little going into the power grid is, uh, basically power grid will affect everything else. It, it is very, very important. Power grid can put down many, many systems. The, the, you, though most of us uh, have uh, battery storages, etc., but it's all only for a limited time. If you put it down uh, by 24 hours or two months or whatever it is. In fact, uh, the Americans are a little paranoid about power grids. Uh, they are even protecting their power grid against EMP. You can't, you can't believe that EM, EMP is a very, very powerful, uh, that is electromagnetic pulse when you detonate a nuclear bomb over or create uh, such a artificial thing over. Uh, the, the, they, they say even if they're nuked uh, by uh, the enemies, the power grid should be survived. That is the amount of work they've done and they're still doing it, uh, looking at costs and whatnot, whatnot, and what is the best method of doing it. They're doing it. So, uh, of course, uh, in a country like ours, where uh, quite a few parts of a country is not even electrified, uh, it, 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 uh, it, it, it's not that important. But definitely, because now today, uh, we are entering the so-called world-class industrial leadership, uh, industrial um, production, and we want to be there. Hence, we have to protect our power grid. And how do we do that? So you have to recognize, first of all, that this can be disrupted. That I, somebody can, say for example, give a false uh, uh, data that the, some industry is not consuming. Uh, some, some industries in certain regions are not consuming. So that data, one big change in data, uh, can go back to the generating system and they can shut down the generator or shut down the switching system. So it's so easy. So uh, it's one example. I'm not going into many other infrastructures, but this is one example of what happens. So I'll go into slightly more detail in uh, what happened in Ukraine in December 15. See, the, they attacked the power grid. The attackers hijacked distribution level industrial control systems. Now, industrial control systems are uh, supposed to be something uh, that are, uh, that is, if you have uh, a lot of missionary and a lot of things to be controlled uh, from a central point. Uh, finally, the product might be one, but then there are many other processes. So the process control uh, is done by monitoring all the state vectors. Like for example, if there is a furnace, the temperature, the pressure, etc., are collected. And uh, they, they are brought to uh, a, a data acquisition system which controls. Now uh, in India, for example, in DRDO, we have been doing so many, so many such things, but we never thought of uh, buying an industrial process control system from somewhere, industrial control system. We made it ourselves, so it's pretty safe. Whereas people, you know, uh, once these things become a little bit more common, uh, the established industry makes very reliable 
a lower cost because if you develop a control system for yourself, uh, it is costlier than buying and configuring a ready-made available one. So the whole world has gone that way. Like for example, Siemens is extremely good uh, in making uh, this control system, industrial control system. But then uh, if you have, uh, like, like for example, Windows. Windows is an operating system. Now everyone knows Windows. And hence, Windows is a vulnerable system because its knowledge about what it contains, what the, the source code, everything is generally available to everybody and definitely to the hackers. So if you go to generalities, it is pretty difficult, easy to, 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 to understand the system better because the most important thing is if you want to hack something, you understand that. So what these guys did, they hijacked the distribution level industrial control system and issued commands through human machine interface that is basically through the control and displays that resulted in power outage. Meanwhile, the attackers locked out the grid operators uh, and uh, to diminish their operators ability to override the attack. Not only they did the attack, but they saw that the guys, uh, because the power goes and complaints come and people will react. So they even cleverly uh, took away control from the control system. So it's not easy what they did. First, they did a rec recce mission. That they studied Ukraine's electrical electricity system and related systems for at least six months. Now, uh, this is, this somebody has gone into depth uh, to understand this could have been even more. The, the study became apparent uh, only after six months. A variety of open source information was available to the attackers, as I said. Uh, and the technology used by the Ukrainian distribution companies. For example, a detailed list was found online, the type and versions of the remote terminal units, etc., the control system software. Uh, and the, the, intro, uh, the, the control system software lacked two-factor two authentication. They found out that there is a weakness. Invariably, you always look at big points in a system to attack it. Be it uh, the Achilles uh, heel or Duryodhan's uh, whatever part uh, was supposed to be weak. So the most important thing is when you build a system, you build it robust, then you are safe. But how robust and whatnot is, and it, it is expensive to build a very robust system. So it's a sort of uh, difficult um, decisions to take, taking into account the security risk and the cost of making. Then they went for fishing, spear fishing that is pointedly attacking specific people. Based on the recognition, the attackers targeted specific employees in specific components of the distribution companies. Uh, then they, they sent corrupted Microsoft Word files. Then the corruption from their files into the system got in. Then they understood, they took control of the systems and they installed what is called Black Energy 3 malware. Now, Black Energy 3 malware allowed the attackers to communicate with the infected system. Attackers so began harvesting credentials and escalating their privileges. The point is, they could switch on off anything at their will. And they took complete control of the system and uh, 27 substations were taken off and uh, it was uh, for hours together the system was off. The point to note that here is what is written right here. The black energy malware has also been found within organizations that operate critical infrastructures in the United States, not only in the Ukraine. That means like just like you want to buy a virus software, antivirus software from various sources uh, in the underground network, you can buy black energy three and uh, use it. So it has become, it's not uh, that, uh, you know, uh, a state actor, like uh, for example, uh, 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 government, uh, Chinese or whichever government supports uh, an organization like uh, small DRDO like thing and then put a lab there and then start developing all the technologies to, uh, to, to develop malware. No, you can buy this malware. This is the problem. Now it has become more and more problematic. So if a disgruntled group in the country uh, gets, uh, gets, to, gets across this and uh, buy this and then they can easily bring down our grid. 
So the effort to do drone attack has come down drastically. But still, uh, the, 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 the legwork that you have to do before that is quite huge. And uh, you've got to have, see, that means it's not the computer guy who's computer savvy guy who could uh, hack into a computer is needed. He is, he, is, he is very much needed to do that. But without the guy who understands electricity, distribution systems, generating systems, all these are required in order to achieve a success. So now how does this happen? See, uh, we said the, the control system network the, the, is, is quite, now people have learned, the people have learned that uh, this is being broken into, so we have to control it. So they have a very, very private network. Uh, here in the ICS network is a very private network. Uh, then there are a lot of ICS net devices which are controlled by the network. Now, uh, a big power corporation needs a corporate the guy, the, 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 the general manager has to know the state of uh, every one of his substations, uh, especially nowadays when you want to do work from home, uh, definitely you will need to know uh, how your uh, business is doing. So he will access this network through the corporate business network. The corporate business network itself is well, def well defended with firewalls and many other protecting measures. But he picks up data from this uh, in order to monitor and uh, he's now the corporate business network is connected to the core network, which is to be protected. But then that has to be connected because if it is a multinational, he has to talk to somebody uh, from somewhere. Then the president of the company has to know and might be. So it is accessible to the internet, which is open, wide open. Or you can even have wireless networks uh, remotely um, controlled. So you take it near the plant, where the Wi-Fi can reach, uh, one car is parked outside, you may not know what he is doing. He will have the equipment to study this and then jam or do the needful to shut down the equipment. So compromising industrial control systems is becoming quite common, quite easy. Uh, so uh, just a slightly more data, data on the industrial control system. Uh, this you might have come across uh, uh, when you studied the stuckness, which I'm also going to say something about it. It's called a supervisory control and data quality system. So you won't have multiple machinery and plants, boilers, many things uh, in your factory to produce something out finally. You've got to uh, control them, control. And then in order to control them, you should know the, all the internal states of that. So you need a data quality system. You acquire the temperature. You acquire the pressure, you acquire the, the other things which are important for that particular machine. And then get all of them together now and then put some algorithms because you want to control them. You want to stabilize the temperature. So you want to turn on the heater or you want to turn on uh, the cooler in order to control. So you need the control system. So these are called SCADA. <coughs> Early SCADA systems were independent with no connectivity to other systems. This is what I mentioned. Uh, this could be out of uh, the ability to do it yourself. And the other one is uh, because it's cheaper, more reliable stuff is available readily in the market. So you go to second generation systems were distributed using local networks or leased lines. Third generation of SCADA systems are wide area network over the public internet using industry standard protocols and security techniques. Now, moment you say industry standard protocols, means you open a book, you will get the protocol. You don't have to break your neck in order to understand the protocol. This is what it means. Being on the internet, they are potentially vulnerable to attack. But by using standard protocols, you might be able to protect them. But alarming number of cyber attacks, viruses, and data breaches have targeted uh, the SCADA systems. Uh, examples like Stuxnet. So we'll talk a little bit about Stuxnet. Computer worm that was detected in June 20, but allegedly has been around since 2007. Now, uh, when this was done, uh, this was one of the first uh, state 
organized um, attacks. Both Israel and Americans cooperated. Officially, they won't tell you even now. Yes, but through many other technical information, uh, inferences, we have inferred that this was a state-sponsored, United States-sponsored attack. Uh, it was designed to attack industrial programmable logic controllers uh, of nuclear SCADA systems. Comp compromise Iranian PLCs at Iran's uh, Natanz uranium enrichment facility, changing the speeds of the centrifuges at the same time hiding the damage. Reportedly, one fifth of the centrifuges were ruined, but the attackers took great care to avoid catastrophic damage, not to blow cover. See, the point is, they were so clever. What is the aim? The aim was to drastically bring down Iranians' capability to, to produce a nuclear bomb, because Iraq is, I mean, Israel is very, very worried about Iran's, Iranians and their nuclear. So, uh, no, you, you can you can go on. One of the best ways, the easiest ways to do this is to completely slow down their program. Now, this is a new technology that has been not new. This technology is there. In fact, I have a, um, a very good book. If you can read this, uh, it's called Bites, Bombs and Spice. Uh, it's brought out by the um, Brookings Institution. Brookings Institution is a think tank. Uh, they study all this. It's a wonderful book. Some of you have uh, the uh, the time. They have, it's very, very interesting how uh, they not only they, they, they delay uh, the programs, uh, defense programs of various countries. Whether we are on the Indians are on the list, you don't know. So this taking care of we are certainly on the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's why we have to be aware of that. So you, not only during deployment or operations you have to protect yourself. During development you have to protect. See, there could be a lot of missile launch failures. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they they worked on North Korea and successfully controlled that. They delayed it by a couple of years. And the same thing has happened here. And uh, the scary part is Stuxnet's design and architecture or domain specific could be tailored or not domain specific. And it could be tailored as a platform for attacking modern SCADA and PLC. The reason is SCADA and PLCs are common. It means the, the, the SCADA and PLC systems just not be so. The SCADA and PLC can be used in uh, power distribution, transportation sector, chemical plants, many, many other places. So the worms and uh, things can also be common. And the danger is source code is publicly available. You can download. OK, uh, I think uh, I think um, I don't know whether to go into this, how it works. Basically, the very interesting thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one peculiar thing about that is uh, this. This was uh, we saw that uh, most of the attacks are done through networks. So the Iranians were very careful, and uh, the, uh, the the Israeli spies who were studying this uh, knew that they can't break through the introduce this virus through. Ne? So what they did, they made a attractive thumb drive uh, and um, put the Stuxnet um, virus in the thumb drive and managed to smuggle it through somebody uh, into the plant and left it uh, very simply in somebody's drawer. So this guy uh, happened to, again, it's quite a uh, chance. He happened to see what looked at his shining new thumb drive in a poor country like Iran. The thumb drive is very attractive. So this guy, uh, even we will be tempted to do that, took it and then plugged it into the USB port. And lo and behold, uh, the Saxonite entered. And uh, there is no way this guy knew. Otherwise, he would have alerted, alarmed. It was so well designed that it went there sat there for some time, took a lot of time in order to be effective. So uh, this, basically, it need not even have interconnectivity. It need not have the network to help it. Anyway, so I will not, I'll skip this, how it works. Uh, now come to the more important aspect of uh, the 
the defense uh, sector defense sector <clears throat> now uh, since i am a, a avionics specialist i take pride in telling in many presentations that uh, uh, the cost of avionics is so much uh, that almost 70% of the cost of a fighter aircraft is all in avionics it used to be maybe 7% when or even 0% when uh, the the right brothers took off uh, it was only the airframe and some propulsion but now it's all dominated by the uh, the avionics guys mm. uh, basically because the avionics guys are able to produce so much of uh, uh, radars and uh, anti i mean missile guidance and what not the aircraft has to protect itself hence the survivability most of the money is spent on surviving the aircraft to defend the aircraft as it gets into the elevator so everything is now electronics computers software so on board electronics uses processors memories fpgas field programmable gate arrays are very vulnerable to malware especially as most of these are not made in india see we have a very very special problem we don't make a single chip in this country and come through a susceptible supply chain even real time operating system see hardware is slightly more difficult to tamper with it's extremely difficult to tamper with software mm. even real time operating system which are imported or a potential source of malware and we are buying it from the us left right and center with established houses the american defense ministry doesn't believe those guys but we believe we have to believe because they know the source basically because we don't make hardware now do we make stuff like operating system software i'll come to that later <clears throat> so for example what one example is a slightly more complicated example but hidden services or back doors in an actual uh, chip or difficult to find and once installed may prove difficult to mitigate the problem is once you put some code into the fpga new brand new fpga you are importing it will have some code left in it okay and it's a, it's a huge fpga millions of gates couple of gates are going to be infected with a function okay it could be a time bomb function it means when time system time reaches something you do something as simple as that or it could be much more different much more devious so these things are difficult to find out you need to test the fpga so thoroughly will take you lots of time whereas uh, in a production environment what do you do the computers are being developed tested everything is over now you take it to the production production guy gets the components does some minimum inspection and then installs them and then lo and behold the, the virus or the the malware has got into your computer and got into your aircraft avionics system got into tanks whatever it is so now that comes to something called a trusted computer can you believe it that we are talking about a trusted computer we are always trusting computers why do you call trusted computing the hardware vulnerabilities can be taking place at various levels they have thoroughly analyzed this it's not a specialist class so i won't go into depth but what i am saying is you can introduce a design stage like me for example in india we do have some uh, capability to design asics design chips we do have and we have good people to design and for fabrication we have to send it out to somewhere so even design stage we can have problems of interference then it goes to fabrication at that point for example uh, when we i was looking at the electronic voting machines uh, the the design is done at bell bharat electronics fabrication is done in uh, in somewhere in taiwan or somewhere uh, and uh, <clears throat> so they said uh, nobody can interfere with this because it if it's fabricated only for us and comes to us we install in the evm so nobody can tamper with that but imagine you can you the, the somebody some external agency can interfere here doing packaging you can do you can you can actually if the pin counts are same 
you can stamp another i mean we are extremely good at stamping made in india many things but they can make once we discover uh, that uh, what we thought was a 486 processor stamped clearly did not have a co processor in it it was empty so how did we find out by first burning our finger making a computer and finding that's a problem then we started x raying the chip as it comes in you can imagine so there are two issues one is counterfeiting counterfeit components the other one is the being a, the ability to add uh, bugs in the system and supply chain so this is this is a very serious problem for us especially because and you know who has made this the americans they have all the capabilities but still they study it with in depth i don't think we have an institute which does this so this, this happened to them only again a report in bloomberg the big hack how china used a tiny chip to infiltrate us companies chinese based corruption of the supply chain in the super micro computer motherboards we have seen this so it it it's 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 pervasive and big, always there so more on this is these are the typical computers look like in, when they are in the tanks or aircraft etc so so we are talking about trusted computing see we cannot completely believe somebody you can have some trustworthiness in them so total conventional fully secure computing platforms are extremely desirable because they do exactly what they are supposed to do nothing more nothing less but they are very uncommon because they are difficult to design and maintain once upon a time we were in that side okay but now it is cheap and easy to force a product boot specific software so not all data necessarily needs protection this is the assumption that the entire computing system uh, can be trusted the whole thing is to reduce cost and make it first of all make it feasible to make a system like that if you want a totally completely trusted system uh, you know which is impossible today it's possible in a limited manner when we make our own fabrication our own design and uh, control it we are doing it some places we are doing it in our country for example the uh, space missions use uh, something from our foundry from this uh, from chandigarh though it's a very low 386 kind of computers processors they use because it's much more dependable than anything that very high end processors uh, very highly space qualified that qualified all this is different but because you can have hidden functions in the place so in again uh, i think uh, we are running out of time uh, no problem basically the whole concept is to 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 have this anti tamper cyber security reliability put in that supply chain integrity key management safety critical so we have all the tools required are secure boot cryptography data at risk protection now the most important thing to counter uh, cyber security cyber attacks etc or this and the most important thing is cryptography you should be able to protect yourself uh, against an attacker we'll go into detail later the other threats are as we said the, the, it's the same thing uh, supply chain threats nobody in the world is able to make a product by himself this is a dreamliner aircraft you can imagine every imagine the number of companies they make not only in in us but in uk in japan for example the forward fuselage is made in japan and uh, the landing gear is made in france and majority of them are coming with embedded processors it's not just the, the there could be even the mechanical systems can be uh, tampered with mm. for example i can have uh, uh, the, 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 this part is coming from godrich gurish us i can tamper with the cad files of that numerical control machines and produce a part which is one millionth uh, in error and this will lead to after might be 100 hours of flying the engine is going to fly so this is the level of uh, it is not only the, only the computer it, i mean it's not only the computer it, it's every part of the system can be tampered with 
through because they're using computing technology the communication technology control technology to even to see the the engine part engine is uh, engine design is basically a software it's a file it's a file that is sent to the manufacturing agency to manufacture and today it is much more easier also you can have uh, the 3d printing technology and make some parts and imagine what you can do to the data uh, on uh, corrupt the data on that what will happen and nobody can measure nobody can find out the fault because to measure so to such accuracy is that every time a production part it will cost a lot of money mm. so so again supply chain threats which is the most applicable to us because everything that we do is being bought out from many many places so basically what you do is the guy who wants to attack has to invest uh, get into the vendors situation and not one vendor not one place multiple countries many places he can put his people and find out uh, for example producing providing updates that contain logical bomb hidden function in the back door providing security patches that are ineffective or that increase vulnerability there are many way, ways of doing this uh, thing you can even do it uh, very comfortably when uh, we have uh, for example uh, you you have uh, the equipment installed in uh, our airbase uh, from the aircraft and it is not functioning so you, the guy maintenance guy comes uh, he comes uh, with this uh, computer to check the milk data from this data now we can very simply infect it i mean not the original company it could be somebody in between some spy agency some terrorist organization which can put uh, this uh, uh, data uh, and uh, in fact the test equipment which is much more easy because the test equipment are made out of windows and things like that normally he takes a notepad or a tough book to the place so it is becoming much and more, more and more difficult anyway that so when it comes to uh, the aviation we have more problems we have the connected aircraft now the aircraft was uh, very well independent they had a mission plan and uh, the pilot will fly but now we have a simple low bandwidth point to point uh, communication system they have high bandwidth networks we have tcip networks you can imagine all the bookings that these then you made your life so easy can you believe so if you want to book a ticket uh, in about 25 years back you have to go to the indian airlines office stand in a queue and get it done and if you want to do multiple sectors of course uh, the 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 aviation industry was much more advanced those days itself but otherwise it's impossible now the complete air traffic management is being done uh, in a integrated manner so you can do you you can get into things like uh, aircraft control domain with systems and networks in order to safe operation of the aircraft airline information service domain you can even have uh, now uh, if you go into a, a modern aircraft the latest aircraft you will have a thumb drive Uh, you can have a usb port uh, for you to insert your system to charge or even to use your system now you can very the, the, there has been uh, case studies where some passengers uh, benevolent passengers have proven that they can interfere into the aircraft system through this so moment and uh, uh, i think the air marshal clearly understand this electronic flight bags now normally when we make a uh, aircraft system we are very very careful we test everything so many times uh, and uh, it is certified that it works the, the earlier the pilots were carrying uh, books uh, on a thumb pad or whatever it is it's called uh, uh, flight manuals which used to they carry and then but now we have implemented all that in a tough book so it's basically a notebook which is tough means which will stand some kind of normal damage and then uh, uh, but the os is again window used by the crew to create a paperless cockpit is very good but then you can alter is literally changes plan through that flight plan you can tamper you can hijack the aircraft uh, without the pilot knowing it okay at uh, 50000 at 30 40000 feet uh, if he is diverted uh, from his flight path through this method he can do anything about it he can't even see properly 
I mean, there are methods, of course, but those are getting uh, sort of diluted. I was once uh, traveling uh, when the 747 uh, uh, was brought into the country. I traveled and uh, requested the pilot that I'm an avionics guy. I want to see the cockpit. So he took me and then he kept me there for almost the entire flight from here to London. And then uh, he learned from me on all those controls and whatnot to displays. He turned, the, both, both the crew had turned uh, their seat to look at me, I was explaining. The aircraft was flying itself. The only disruptions were from ATCs across. The, the pilot could have very, if somebody is hijacking, he could have gone out. So what I mean to say is it's, it's, it's becoming more and more vulnerable. But there are more systems like that. Uh, the time is running out and I have a lot of slides left. Uh, the impact of cyber attacks is very, uh, uh, very, very, I say very, very dangerous, can be of small nature, very big nature. For example, uh, we, we talked about the power uh, distribution system. Now, uh, when you want to distribute uh, power, uh, the, the control of the frequency and phase is very, very important. The generating side, if you want to mix these things and uh, some power plant goes down, you want to use some other thing. So all these things are very, very important. The phase and the frequency are very important. So they are timed, centrally synchronized to, to picosecond accuracies by using GPS. Mm. Now GPS is all pervasive. GPS is another huge, uh, very comfortable system without which we can't live today. So when I change minor changes to that, it affects the timing accuracy and the electricity uh, the electric uh, network can completely fail. Maybe even loss of generators, etc., burn them off. So we can we can play with uh, GPS, and the GPS jammer or spoofer is not very expensive. It it, it doesn't need uh, um, uh, infrastructure uh, that was needed for James Bond to produce all these things. You can do it uh, uh, in the garage with uh, available tools. More and more software and hardware tools are available to you. So that is the problem with all this. And majority, the, one of the biggest problems with GPS, why is it so vulnerable? The frequency of GPS is an atomic clock. So everybody knows what that frequency is. So you can easily produce a jammer to jam it or somebody to deceive it means you can establish a system that tells the user, for example, if I'm an attack ship, I can be off by 50 kilometers. It has happened in even in our own um, mm -hmm. services that we have been deceived uh, by jamming, by spoofing. And there are very, very modern things that are coming, which are going to take us. So now let's get into the space area. Space is congested, contested and complete competed on this. Now, it's no longer few satellites there. No, as you can see, actually, you can visibly see the uh, 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 show uh, when these guys launch uh, uh, the Tesla and all these guys launch um, so many satellites because now the, the, the whole thing is reversed. We're going to have smaller satellites in the low Earth orbit, networked satellites, hundreds and thousands of them. So they can have lots and lots of problems. One of the most important um, methods of doing this is the cyber space threat. And there are many other possibilities, but uh, the cyber is a very, very important thing there. So traditionally satellites used to be very standalone. Then again, the same issue. Now SATCOM networks are trending to internet protocol based technology as integral parts of broader networks with shift improvements in efficiency and property. Obviously, you get improvements, but also greater potential vulnerability uh, to the advanced, persistent, and apparently state-supported cyber attacks. Now, you can hijack a satellite. For example, bringing down a satellite case study. Again, Ukrainian attempts to bring down a Russian satellite. See, the year it's Ulta, even Ukrainians can do that. Not only Ukrainians, some students from a, a, a sort of bright students from 
an engineering college can do this. Uh, one of the master strokes by Iranians in 2011, they, they brought down, mastered a technique to compromise aircraft via GPS uh, spoofing. They successfully captured an American um, drone uh, by reconfiguring the coordinates, the GPS signal, and uh, they made it land there. They captured it. Russia has insulted GPS jammers of 250,000 uh, on cellular towers. For example, most of the missiles launched at, in case of eventual big war, uh, the, uh, both with conventional or non-conventional weapons, the Americans will try to attack the Russian cities. Russians have the masters in GPS jamming. Very simple. Even, even I can do that. I can make a jammer uh, in my garage. But they have installed it all over the countryside, all over the cities, uh, to disrupt the navigation of incoming missiles. I'm quite sure. See, these are possible for me to talk. If we are doing it, I might not even know, which is good for us. So, uh, while on this subject, uh, as I said, uh, we'll we'll just skip some of these space types uh, because time is running out. One very good example of deception uh, is uh, the uh, system called the Mesmer. Now, uh, the drones are becoming everywhere. It is, uh, you can just buy a drone for $100 or, or let's talk about 10,000, 20,000 rupees. You can buy it in India. Some of them are being made here also. But what we do is, but basically what the, the, the controller has a, uh, a transmitter is transmit to the drone controls. It controls the drone to fly, how to fly, go up, down, turn like that. Now what uh, this is becoming a huge problem for everywhere. It's, it's, it's a subject by itself. There's protecting, uh, 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 protecting against drones, protecting infrastructure against drones is a big issue. So one of the system that shows that how easily you can do all this is called Mesmer. What, what they did is, See, when you send data, uh, you, you are going to send them data through a protocol. For example, this is what is going to, information is sent in zeros and ones uh, from the, uh, from the uh, controller to the drone. And drone will follow these instructions and obey that. So all you do is you take control, you have your own controller, you overpower the drone's controller with higher power or through other means. And then tell him to land wherever you want. So if you want to recover the drone without shooting down, because shooting down will probably hurt people. So, uh, so what you do is create and then make it land. And mind you, this was generated by the prison department in US because the prisoners in USA were high tech and they were getting all the required uh, stuff like drugs and guns uh, through the drones. And uh, this is a very good example of uh, simple cyber working. Now, when it comes to weapon systems, there are so many vulnerables. You can, you can do things like radar receiver, radio communication receiver. Everything that is open to RF and things like that can be manipulated. Not necessarily this. For example, you have uh, it easy milking of data. You can have a USB port on the aircraft. And uh, you can simply ask, no, anybody can go into that. Of course, it's well protected. All that is okay. Uh, I spent uh, quite a lot of time in air bases. So I know uh, all said and done, you cannot stop the laborers from coming and erecting new buildings or cleaning up stuff. You, you know, you just can't do that. You give, give him one USB port and uh, he will insert whatever you want into that aircraft. So there are many, many issues associated with the system. I'll give you one example. Uh, of uh, what we did ourselves, totally indigenous system. Uh, the, the software and hardware were indigenous. But then the India is not fully prepared for all the other sensors. For example, the inertial navigation system, which tells you where the aircraft is, what its attitude and whatnot, or imported from France. And similarly, many other things. So the next diagram will tell you, for example, these are all Indian systems. These are Russian systems. These are French systems. These are Israeli systems. Now this is a, and thanks to all this, the aircraft is very powerful. It works well. 
But imagine a guy sitting here, for example, uh, uh, go back to this. See, for example, there is a pod. Pod is an attachment to the aircraft. It, it is carried, that means it's carried only when the particular mission, the command function is required. So this pod is attached and float and then comes back and the pod has to be maintained, repaired. So now uh, the guy is sitting on the uh, on, on my interconnectivity because I need to know uh, what he what information he got. He's a sensor, so he has to send it to me uh, for the computer to compute and do whatever he want. So is also my radar warning receivers sitting on this bus, sitting on the same system. They are detecting the threats. Uh, that is the emitters. See, one of the most important thing uh, about uh, um, the defense of a country is the knowledge of the emitters. Emit uh, means the radars. We have so many radars to locate the enemy incoming targets. Now, if we make ourselves known, the signatures of these radars are known to them, it is as good as our radars are destroyed. We don't have any radar because it's easy for it to jam. So the most difficult thing is to find out the signature. My job on this equipment is only to find that the radar warning receiver, his job is to do that. And if he flies over the country and routinely he collects data, and if this guy, any of these guys pick up this information, we are completely at a loss. We have French, we have Israelis, we have Russians. So just to bring a point that it is, it is extremely difficult. Now come to an, another extreme. A country which is capable of making the most advanced aircraft. F-35 is not the most advanced. F-22 is still the most advanced aircraft. We don't need attackers. Sometimes we can take care of ourselves. I told you the robustness is what is most important. If you're not robust, somebody can find a loophole and enter your system. This F-22, in 2007, 12 F-22s were going from Hawaii to Japan. After crossing the international data, data line, the data, all 12 experienced multiple failures, completely flopped. The reason, you know what happens when you cross a timeline like that? Zero becomes 24. Okay. It's a huge stuff. And this becomes unreliable. And the reason is, it has got 1 million lines of code. It's got such a huge amount of code. See, when we write code for flight control system, we keep it very less. We keep it to a few kilo lines of code and test it. To test such a system will take years together. So the software-based programs are, are definitely prone to more and more attacks. In any case, the Americans have realized this, and as usual, they are the first to realize. They have found out. Uh, that the problems that have been discovered so far is only the tip of the iceberg. There are uh, many, many, uh, they have a US government accounting office, many data, the, the, the country is pretty open in certain areas. Top secret, they keep it top secret, but most of the other information is available. So they did an audit on all these systems and uh, they are uh, able to find out all the problems and they have said it's a, the, the American, um, uh, different different systems are very poor with reference to cyber security. In spite of the basic reason is when we start building these systems, we want to make them work. We want to struggle throughout running against them to make them work. One of the most important requirement is what what the air force or services will give you as a requirement. Is this my I want to fight this war? I want to drop these kind of weapons, I want these functions, but they never tell you that you have to protect me against cyber security. That was not so far. Now their task started telling, and this will influence the design cycle. It will cost you more, cost you more money and time, but still you can do it. Uh, so again, uh, I'm talking about through what all you can enter the system, your, your fighter system, through the maintenance system, industrial control system, microelectronics, targeting. You can enter the system through so many ways. Anyway, I, uh, I'll go. So what is important to us? See, our never peer, uh, near peer adversaries want to win the battle before 
the shot is fired. China has invested billions of dollars in the development of offensive cyber capabilities, including use of AI. I didn't touch upon it because the time is, I mean, really short. I wore short that time. But high performance electronics are key to our armed forces ability to deliver lethal effects. So we have to now protect our electronics, software, systems. Especially in India, we rely on a multitude of subsystems and critical components. Not only components, systems. Uh, suppliers across the world to build our open systems. These supply chains should be easily interrupted in, into since they are not under our control. Anyway, so this is a warning. It's very important to, uh, for example, as I again I've emphasized, a country like USA, which produces most of the things themselves, are also highlighting and they're doing more work on this area. It is essential, highly essential for India to provide technologies and tools to investigate Indian armed forces, weapon systems, vulnerabilities to cyber threats. We have to study this. This, okay. Okay, you're buying weapons. You're buying uh, uh, what is called a man pad. All, most of us know what a man pad is. Uh, basically, it is a, a heat seeking missile launched from the shoulders, shoulder of a man to bring down a helicopter or a low flying aircraft, or many things. Now it is bought from a company called Raytheon or whatever it is. You think it will going to work? But look at this title, CAA as device. This is the very latest information. December, uh, end of last year. CAA devised a way to restrict missile given to allies. The missile, the missile is made, tested for all the software and brought out to the factory. And in the supply chain from that to the country which is meant for. And they are supplying this to their friends, not to the enemies. They are supplying this to their friends like the Saudi Arabians. The CAA has come up with a smart arms control solution that will restrict the use of the missile to a particular time and particular place. And it's simple called geofencing. You know, it is done now, it is, it's available. You can read, you know, go to any this thing and key in this word, you'll get on the net. Mm. Okay, so this is how dangerous it is. And they also found out F-35, the best aircraft in the world, has a beautiful thing called Automatic Logistic Information System, ALICE. Now, uh, it is so distributed from the bases to across the world from many people operating from Japan to Netherlands or whatever, Britain to all come to a central base database through a cloud and all that. And then the big concern is it can be and it will be tampered with. So when you when you go into this is a very very desirable feature. I know when the air marshal was in service, how he would have loved to have a system like this to put his aircraft down there. Mm. One of the biggest problems is to keep the aircraft up and flying. But this is the problem. Now coming to the last thing, even without cyber security, it is information security. We are talking about information security. This is a Falkland where. An air launched exoset disabled HMS Sheffield in May 82. This is in Falkland, Argentina versus UK. The loss of 20 lives, it sank six days later. Then two air launched exosets sank Atlantic conveyor on, on conveyor ship on 25th May. So it means the Argentinians are domineering. They were, they were winning the war against the British. The British very powerful, you can imagine, uh, uh, martial power, martial power. So how did they do it to, with the Exocet, a radar guided anti-ship missile developed by whatever company and uh, it was carried by Super 8. It skims over the water, that means it's released and it skims over the water uh, and uh, pops up near the ship and hits it. So that means the ship's defensive system, the radar, and other sensors cannot pick up this flow because the, the surface of the sea is so heavy and so it's very, very difficult. Anyway, radars don't, when you, the radar looks down, it gets more clutter than the target. So this was a killer mission. Missile and it killed. But then what happened? 
France was Britain's. See, this statement is made by Defense Secretary for Britain. France was Britain's greatest ally during the Falkland War, providing secret information to enable uh, MI6, uh, the intelligence fellows. The French gave Britain information on the exoset, how to tamper with it. Now, even without cyber, that's what I'm trying to say. So then afterwards, the Argentine Navy launched its uh, exoset, completely missing it. So this is the story. And uh, I have a couple of more slides Go ahead. to show how we are organized, but uh, thank you. Yeah, you can cover that uh, PMS, the Indian organization. So the Indian organization of cybersecurity organization, uh, this is picked up from uh, an official uh, presentation. So we have <clears throat> everybody working for it. PM's office, PMO, Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of External Affairs, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of uh, Mighty, it is called, Communication and Information Technology or Electronics Information Technology. Then there are many non-government organizations. So uh, the most important things are uh, the active thing. Finally, who does this is this information technology, Department of Telecom. Oh. And uh, the most important thing is the <clears throat> uh, CERT, which is the Indian Computer Emergency Response Team. You might have seen in the papers yesterday, they said they have predicted that there will be an attack um, on using uh, certain emails don't open them and things like that. So they're doing their job. Uh, and uh, also uh, through uh, uh, RNET. Uh, and there are DRDO labs also working on this. See, for example, multi-agency center with uh, uh, dip, 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 DRDO. And uh, there are many hidden organizations also in this. But this is the organization. So I cannot say that Indians are sleeping. But effectively, Effectively, if you want to go and find number of people who will do in some simple thing like routine auditing, going to a banking system uh, and then finding out uh, uh, the health of the system, is there been recently any intrusion? Because the attack doesn't come. In. One good thing about it is the attacks don't happen like this. It is intrusion is done. You can do the intrusion detection. Clean, maintain it. If you brush your teeth daily, you won't go into a dentist. But if you don't do that, you'll end up with it. Similarly, as may not much a very easy example, but it's much more difficult. The number of experts in this field are very less. So the private sector opening up. In fact, one of the most important thing, uh, in fact, uh, in this book, uh, there is a chapter uh, on, uh, that is, this book is called Bites, Bombs, and Spice, uh, written by, uh, wrote out by Brookings Institution. Uh, it talks about one chapter fully on how to involve the private sector. Because these computer savvy uh, things are with the private sector. The students, the brighter students, uh, or with the private sector. And uh, the motivation to do things are better with the private sector. Because it's a spy with a spy game. It is, uh, the spy is not controlled by any government. I mean, the, the thief, the criminal is not controlled by any government. So we had to match him with uh, some monetary gains for the private sector. Uh, with this, I will come to a stop and uh, I can take questions. Thank you, uh, PMS. That's been an excellent one. And uh, uh, it's a very, very informative. I'm sure everybody would have uh, you know, enjoyed, uh, uh, I mean, uh, gathered a lot of uh, you know, knowledge on this. A uh, uh, couple of uh, you know, observations. Uh, with respect to the very important points that you raised. One is, of course, our supply chain and our dependency on uh, uh, so much of hardware. Almost pretty much everything is we are dependent. Therefore, that explains why we have diversified a lot of uh, you know, sources for our IT hardware, electronic hardware. Uh, there are, I mean, for, for example, when I uh, uh, was advising, when I continue to advise one of the companies, he, like you said, the chip is designed and the patent is owned by him, but the chip is fabricated in Taiwan. So that always leaves 
a certain amount of vulnerability. So when we compare this, you, you think we have not invested adequately on hardware in the context of the cybersecurity issue? Okay. We can, See, uh, and we can come on. Yeah, very, very uh, valid question. Uh, in fact, um, Indians were not sleeping, really speaking. We you know, created a lab called Anurag uh, way back, 20 years back. Okay. And we started making our own uh, chips. See, the point is, uh, the, if you look at uh, 8086, that, that was a technology around that time, silicon technology. Mm. The caps were in micrometers. Okay. Mm. Uh, so we established some foundries for making such chips. Now, the, from micrometers in the Western world, I'm talking about developing, developed world, uh, it went to one micron, then 0 0.1, 0 0.01. Like that, it kept on going lower and lower. I mean, in terms of distances, so number of devices can be more on the chip, more functions can be done. Now, this is a sea change in making these chips, the technology required for this, and the investment made. You can imagine the, the, the lithography has to be made with such precision. Like, you know, we are now working at uh, uh, the, uh, the corona virus levels in terms of distances on the chip. So the machinery, the, everything has to be high detail. Mm. So uh, this, can, this could have been caught up. But then when somebody like this does it outside, he makes million chips, billion chips, right. and sells it. So all this, all this technology came through commercial. Mm. We, we were not involved in the commercial side. That is the biggest mistake. And government cannot invest in a company, government to public sector company, and then uh, ask it to, you know, give it a free hand to keep on improving its technology. Precisely. We didn't, you know, uh, manage both the integration of commercial as well as the security. Absolutely correct. That's right. Uh, fine. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, I've, uh, let me uh, open out to everybody else. Please ask questions. Jacob, welcome. Um, good to see you here. Okay. Uh, uh, any questions before I start with some of uh, my own questions? Uh, uh, let me open out to the uh, audience. Please ask your questions. Raise your hands. And... Yeah, please, uh, Jacob. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah Professor, uh, a very, very enlightening talk and very valuable information. Very, very well structured. And um, one of the things which you really brought out is the cost of cybersecurity. The, the, that yes, but it but there is a cost you have to pay in order to be secure. And uh, um, what I talk, there are two aspects. One is the damage which one can do, something like uh, equivalent to a guerrilla warfare. Um, and the other is specifically use uh, these malware to be able to get a focused information. Say the good example you gave of uh, the Iranians having been able to land a drone into their territory to be able to capture it. Now that is unlike a destruction, it is more focused and to be able to bring it up. Now in all this, uh, Go ahead. Uh, Jekka, your voice seems to be cutting. Are there ways of being able to modeling it in order? to OPR and SS, uh, set of satellites. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's a very, uh, I, if I understand your question, uh, one of the things is uh, how do we use uh, our own satellite system? Uh, in fact, that's a very, very big uh, advantage. We have to have this system. And 
because gps is highly controllable you, you can selectively forget about the enemy the the, the, the if you are fighting a, a war with america's uh, friends uh, he can uh, spoof the system for you very very locally so depending upon gps for many of these things is a very big danger and uh, hence the irnss which is now uh, coming to be mature okay uh, is um, very important but the problem is some of this for example if you have uh, uh, suppose we are buying the rafal the rafal comes with a inertial navigation system which is not made in india uh, the the system that uh, uh, the gps system it obviously has a gps system because gps has to update the inertial system which will drift with time now if you want to remove that portion integrate irns signal into that it's a tough job now if air force was uh, very clear in its uh, uh, at the time when you see the requirements for this was given 20 years back almost 15 years back uh, so if they had integrated uh, put a clause that indians have to integrate the uh, ins uh, with the irns uh, then uh, it would have been good and, but the point is one raising the problem second is they have to somehow part with certain portion of their ip in order to to for you to enable doing this so most of the modern aircraft are inducting will not take the full advantage of this of course you can put a irns receiver in the cockpit and the pilot can cross verify but deep integration of the system is difficult i, I hope uh, i understood your question because it was not audible because of audio cuts hmm. yeah i think part of the question was that the other question is are we using any model to identify where we should invest irns is one example where perhaps uh, it's a huge investment but definitely it is one way of keeping safe but uh, identifying the probabilities the vulnerabilities the impact and from that aspect uh, are we using any modeling like a, a, a risk free analysis and the like to be able to uh, manage cyber control the damage yeah uh, that is what i brought out uh, i took specifically more interest in the yes control the trusted, trusted optimize, optimize ah. for... so the trusted computing uh, is actually a, a wide open subject it's a public subject in the us and now the if you open the uh, requirements i just happened to look at some american defense requirements they have very clearly stated uh, in their uh, statement that uh, we, we are the, if, if you are making a computer for them you will have to incorporate uh, the trusted computing module in it now that is uh, it's an american product again you can do and they are happy with that now that again is not ours and it's not going to be so expensive for us to investigate because it's a huge field by itself it's not only the it's in hardware but then it has to integrate with itself with the operating system and many other things so we can do uh, some research and we are doing in fact uh, care for example is doing some work on that mm. but uh, if i still feel that uh, things like real time operating systems uh, have to be done in india you see i remember having trying to work with russians on the fifth generation aircraft they said we will not use any of those uh, real time operating systems from imported from them. they went into developing it themselves now when you make a real time operating system you are i mean it's an operating system actually a reduced version of an operating system only for real time use but it costs money lot of effort so many thousands of people have to work on that to design it develop it test it and get it certified no where is the feedback for that how many systems will use that but russians did it in the sense that they know the importance of spending money on something which is not going to give you return on investment so well such kind of decisions have to be taken by us mm. and we are a very very software rich country in the sense i mean i, I won't say we are rich okay we are conversant with software <laughs> i don't think we can write we are not shakespeare's in software but we do write books you know uh, uh, 
one uh, famous the russian uh, origin uh, famous uh, antivirus program and cyber security guy kasparovsky uh, now i listen to one of his uh, talks in australian uh, uh, you know uh, institution and uh, he does very clearly claim uh, that the world's best you know cyber security experts and hackers are russians and that of course uh, when you uh, covered what's happened in ukraine and georgia and latvia i mean that proves it actually so yeah, well, yeah, yeah. one of the fundamental areas of that is that this uh, the russian education system provides exceptional strength in mathematics and that's an extremely important area so do you think we we have not invested adequately in that area because uh, the structure that you explained i'm, I'm familiar with it and uh, we've been raising that issue from 2010 onwards that we need to invest far more in human resources in developing cyber defense and cyber offensive system capabilities particularly incorporating the private sector but i think our numbers are far too low as compared to the chinese the chinese have got huge you know, uh, divisions employed in cyber security issue uh, i uh, completely agree with you in fact the only country uh, which uh, started teaching people cyber uh, is the russian because they call it cybernetics okay mm. that was much before the advent of uh, even computers mm. so they uh, computers are nothing but uh, ultimately uh, machines that implement mathematics that's right so they are extremely good at it uh, and the way you approach the problem is important mm. uh, so they are uh, really good at it and uh, we can definitely take help from them in the international cooperation at least for education models certain special okay. courses can be started modeled but then the mindset also to see as is uh, air marshal said you have to prepare the uh, boys from the beginning you know mm. the, the right thinking attitude that comes from the school education some subjects have to be introduced in the yeah. school that's uh, no no uh, many people uh, many grandparents come and ask one grandparent asked me while we were listening to a talk uh, how can we put teach our uh, children uh, artificial intelligence they are in sixth standard mm. Yeah, this is how they, it goes, uh, because they they see there's a big market for that. Mm. But they never asked us about uh, should we teach them cyber security. Mm. They are interwoven, very very important. Yeah, we are we are still caught in the uh, doctors, engineers, all all on employment and uh, yeah, yeah from that angle. That's Service right. oriented uh, yeah, right. economy. Uh, what about uh, Sunod? You have any questions? And what about those uh, people who are working on talent, uh, you know, policy? This is the time to ask uh, the right questions to the professor. Um, thank you, professor, for that uh, wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, I just want to share uh, your thoughts. I mean, I agree with your thoughts in terms of how uh, academia has been operating in silos, and that has uh, actually impacted our. Uh, Uh, ability to have interdisciplinary studies uh, at a professional level, and uh, I can tell you that uh, in terms of uh, my area, that is international law, back in 2016, 17, 18, uh, the uh, discussions on some of the topics that you covered, that uh, including lethal weapons, autonomous weapon system, was being discussed at the conference of disarmament in Geneva. under the ages of the united nations and during that period india was holding the chairmanship uh, at the uh, 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 the conference on disarmament in geneva now when we uh, uh, trying to study this and uh, interact with the professionals one thing which was very obvious was that the lawyers and the technocrats uh, the engineers they were operating uh, you know in different silos and uh, for Uh, lawyers to comprehend uh, the technology which uh, pro- which develops so quickly and the law has to catch up a lot and uh, and that is actually a problem and uh, until date the discussion between the states at the intergovernmental level is actually not taking place at a formal level it takes place as an informal it is titled as an informal discussion of states on the sidelines of the conference of disarmament this is how it is titled and part of the reason is because the technology has don't want to share the knowledge that is one part of the 
uh, reason. The other part of the reason is that you have lawyers at the negotiating table who are yet to catch up with the technology. That's the other part, which is a part which I would want to, you know, discuss and maybe work together at some point of time in future. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good point you're making. In fact, uh, the use of uh, autonomous weapons uh, is a subject by itself and uh, the uh, legal aspects of that. Uh, basically, most important thing is uh, the technology uh, is not mature. See, uh, in the sense that um, what uh, the Google Assistant does, things like that, uh, is okay. But uh, when you want to do extremely, uh, you want to be, if you want the system to be reliable and also ethical, there's a lot of work being done on, uh, and first of all, the AI, see, I, I mentioned the code, F22 had one point, so and so millions of lines of code. And those are normal codes, okay? It's all designed by humans. And it can be always, uh, uh, it can also always be verified. Okay, when, but, uh, uh, if you look at the code generated by artificial intelligence, you, you the, it could have, nobody can even today know why it has taken the decision. So you are literally blind in certain aspects. Cool, he has taken a decision by running a code. It's, it goes into billions of lines of code in that portion. If you look at the artificial neural network, which part it follows, whatnot is very complicated. So the, even the US defense systems are not uh, different, uh, they're, they're not uh, really completely relying on it. Mm. They, they used uh, this in the, in the, in the, of course, their battleground is always the Middle East and the poor Muslims, but uh, they used it uh, on their Project Raven, if you look at it. Uh, initially, they were ho-ha about it, you know, Google was helping them and they got all those images automatically analyzed and whatnot. But then the, finally, the same general who was so happy to initiate the program after three years, he said, it is not mature enough for me to use. Mm. So uh, it has to be mature. Uh, and again, it's the same thing. It costs you more money to produce reliable code, a reliable system, verifiable system with ethics Im embedded in it. Mm. So, yeah. I, just to add on to what Professor Saudarajan just mentioned on the ethical dimension, and this is for the benefit of all the interns who are participating in this uh, interactive lecture, is it? The ethical question, and that was uh, raised in 2014, it was again raised in 2017, and it's still unanswered. The position, the question was, at what point do you fix attributability, attributability, legal attributability to humans, and what point does that attributability become uh, devolved into the technology itself, uh, because when a technology is autonomous and acts on itself, now if the uh, damage caused by the weapon is more than what is acceptable uh, uh, beyond the collateral damage okay. estimates, then who do you fix the responsibility on? Do you catch hold of uh, Terminator and uh, put the whole that, uh, uh, that entity into a court of law? The answer is no. At the same time, states were saying that, uh, well, it's a technology, it operates on its own. So that was the ethical question. Can we allow, deploy a system which does not provide a scope for human intervention beyond a point of time in terms of operation? That was the question. Now, having said that, this is a request to you. Uh, if you can suggest some topics which uh, can be researched upon, which you believe requires more research uh, from a policy framework, if, you're, if you can share some suggestions, it will be very useful. Thank you. Yeah, the, to answer you, the, uh, the your point is very well taken. Basically, because see, if somebody uh, designs a system, and the system is intended to do certain function, uh, and if he it doesn't do it, then you can catch the designer. I'm talking about a big company or a guy mm -hmm. particular designer, but the designer doesn't know what the decision is based on what code here today at this point of time. So he has to put lots of conditions on the code uh, in order to trace it, uh, what paths, it has to ask every time you should be able to see why that system has taken a decision like this. Uh, the, this traceability is also now getting developed. 
we can work on uh, the ethical uh, that's an area of interest to me also mm -hmm. so what norm is weapons we can work together no yeah we'll plan that out pms absolutely great great okay. now we have uh, you know uh, running out of time so the uh, uh, others uh, in the audience particularly the interns anyone uh, wants to raise a question before i get on to it please come up okay uh, so i have a couple of questions uh, famous uh, i mean certain observations and uh, your comments will be very, uh, should be uh, very illuminating one is you know we have you spoke about the networking issues and of course the trap doors that come with our dependence on imports now for example if i talk about the afnet the air force network in the data link uh, it's a excellent achievement that we've done and we've connected everywhere but much of it is all dependent on the entire routers are all cisco routers although of course now hcl we, we say it is made in india and, and indigenous because the hcl name stamp is there but in effect it's all cisco routers in a study done all over the world the americans themselves have accepted that the routers do have or may have trap doors so uh, if you look at china now china has entirely gone about uh, devising exclusive routers for themselves for in, in the entire communication and so now you remember one of the professor was teaching there he said their entire systems and communication systems are all different and unique it's it's not common with the rest of the world so why haven't we looked at from from a cyber security angle i mean these needs of a uh, lot of foresight and vision to actually look at it and design have we sort of uh, you know ignored these areas significantly or are we getting getting pushed into getting rushed towards operationalizing and uh, capability immediately and therefore we depend on you no know, cisco and others so it's very interesting that you asked this because in 73 september hmm. i joined lrd uh, you might have heard about a project called plan aaron is a big project hmm. very well thought about uh, by the defense services and they charged us with making uh, uh, radio local exchanges radio trunk exchanges hmm. and 73 we made switches we made uh, of course switches were probably as bigger than the table uh, or sometimes bigger as <laughs> big as a room but we made with discrete components transistors some ics and all so but then we were the only people working on that there is no commercial application again we go back to this problem but today mm -hmm. to some extent i would say there are companies like the tejas networks in bangalore uh, they have they are making commercial switches but the, the, for the company to survive there is a need to be market marketability is also important and uh, the, that guy is a bright guy who spent all his time in forgot his name suddenly uh, in abroad learned all the technologies came back now he is trying to push his switches in, in the country it's very tough uh, but we have to it is possible we have the brains to do this switches we have done it even in the avionics area the hiring 6664 switches and what not uh, we have developed uh, but then the the point is the only when you use these switches in large numbers you will find out problems you rectify them and work with them that's true. so definitely it is possible and uh, it has to be promoted everything has a cost to it hmm. and uh, this is one thing that i want to be very clear uh, when i joined gdivo uh, and i when i did my engineering i had uh, uh, only one subject in finance okay one one subject which we completely ignored hmm. uh, the engineering means you have to be well within the finances and you have to manage money this was never uh, most of our design engineers don't care about money this is a very important aspect of technology technology okay. had to feed itself feed itself in order to grow this is where the way missed but it's possible it is done mm -hmm. and uh, in in fact if services want to replace certain switches uh, by them uh, it is possible mm -hmm. there are companies like that maybe more uh, i know about tejas mm -hmm. so that's a very important policy point actually <clears throat> and that's even today we don't integrate well in uh, you know it has start from the academic institutions itself when you 
studying engineering and you're doing a dissertation or you're doing a PhD and you're working on a thesis, there has to be a commercial economic viability angle introduced into it. And this is what is there in the American system. So industries get involved, research institutions get involved, and, and it starts from the academic institution onwards. And therefore, there is a role for the government and our policies need to look into it. Most of the time, we work in silos. And then we wake up when it, it's needed to be done, like the example you gave, the company is invested, gets the capability, but there's no economic viability because now it's too late to break into a market. And that needs, needs to be actually, a push needs to be done by the government. So this is a very important policy observation. In the same angle, you know, you've uh, related a lot of uh, government accounting office, uh, you know, observations and data. That's a very fine institution in the U.S. And, yes. it, uh, you know, it is, some people tend to think that it's equivalent to our CAG system. It's really not. Uh, because the GAO plays much more neutral and very incisive observational, uh, you know, uh, role and addresses where, you know, research has to be focused on as well. So do you think we need something like that or the CAG itself can actually be transformed that way? So CAG is uh, more... Uh, An more, auditing function, actually. Yes, auditing function. And in order to audit completely, they should be able to involve technological people. Mm. That That is what is the missing there. You see, they don't... Uh, uh, I still remember when they were looking at Su-30 files, the clerks will come. Mm. Uh, they will come and sit with us. Uh, with uh, with uh, They will go to SDI, they will go to AST, they will go to air headquarters, four or five tables, collect all that and put together papers. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. That's only clerical. Mm. Uh, and, uh, okay, they are a bit uh, uh, like the lawyers, so they have some minds which uh, they, they were able to identify some problem, but technically they cannot do anything. They, they have to see the CAG, uh, the other is the GO. GO, as he, I don't think he has got permanent uh, technical representation. They do have some technical oh, people. They, the they, American system, in, you know, incorporates and they can access expertise from many ways. That freedom is absolutely, there. Absolutely, yes. For example, I read the, it's a very voluminous report on the 1991 Gulf War. Yeah. The observations were fabulous, absolutely, you know. And, and, and it goes back into, there is an accountability. A uh, yes. observation needs to be acted upon by the government. Otherwise, the Congress will hang the president. You know, that, that, that kind of an accountability needs to come into the whole process. We'll have to involve technologies and uh, uh, definitely it cannot be the uh, CAG. That's right. Anyway, I think yeah. that will be great if you can incorporate that. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot, uh, uh, you know, Professor Sandarajan. And uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, you know, interaction, excellent lecture. And uh, I think this, we need to go forward more uh, with more interactive process. You are on our expert panel anyway, so we'll take advantage of your, uh, you know, expertise more often. And uh, we'll jointly, we'll develop some of the ideas like uh, Suno suggested on policy related, uh, some research work where your expertise will be very, very valuable in this entire process. Uh, let me thank on behalf of the Peninsula Foundation and all of us here for a wonderful you know, uh, lecture and interaction. And uh, thank you so much, uh, PMS, and we look forward to seeing you more often on our uh, institution. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, nice questions. And uh, I was very happy with the, the lawyer who was trying to uh, get these things, get to the bottom of these things. And uh, uh, thanks, uh, Air Marshal. Uh, all the best for your organization. I am with you whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. Jai Hind. Jai Hind.